be afraid to go extra long tonight. And I said, amen. That's right. It was Miss Linda back there. So, that's right. You know, so, you know, Brother Freddie would probably sit through a football game and be okay. Not in church. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Oh, that's fun, right? You know, Spurgeon once said, if you can't laugh at the religion you're part of, it's not a good religion. And so, uh, hey, I, you know, you know, God, one of the fruit of the Spirit, right, is uh, joy. I, you know, hey, I have a great time. Uh, I know sometimes when people listen to me talk, like, if I listen to me talk, I don't have a good time. So, uh, I had to do that this, this morning. I listened to some of the stuff I've done before, and I'm like, ooh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, uh, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, we've been going through 2 Timothy, um, and, and just looking at a few things, looking at the, the idea of Paul being the older man who has, has the older pastor, the older preacher, who's, who's kind of walked the walk so far and, and is getting ready, as we'll see at the end of this book, to kind of pass on. And what Paul has done is taught and discipled Timothy to take the mantle, really, is, is to take the mantle. Now, what we're seeing through Second Timothy is Timothy's learning that, you know, a lot of times what we as younger preachers want is the mantle from the person who came before us, but we don't know what it took to get it. And so here, Timothy is now the man. We looked at it in 2 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul is mindful of the tears, right? That, that, hey, Timothy is now experiencing what the ministry is like. And let me tell you, you know, I love the ministry. I love what God has called me to do, but I'll tell you this, it's not all rainbows and sunshine. You know, there are times where, and, and my wife can tell you, there are times where I just break down and crying because of the issues that are happening. And there's nothing that I know in my physical power to do. But I'm glad that I know the one who cares for us enough that he can take care of it. So, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to read the first nine verses, and then we'll go and pray, and then, then we'll get started. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 1, it says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt mind, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Let's go and pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, I thank you for a perfect word we can open up and study out of. Lord, especially on, on a Wednesday night. Lord, I thank you for everybody who's here. Lord, and as we talk about how to navigate these perilous times and, and what these perilous times look like, Lord, you're honest about it. And Lord, I'm thankful for that. Lord, I pray... Uh, that you just hide me behind the cross, Lord, that, that your Holy Spirit and the Word of God can have free course here this evening. Lord, we pray that whatever is said and done here tonight just gives you glory, honor, and praise. Lord, we thank you again for everything you've given to us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, Paul, Paul finishes up 2 Timothy chapter number 2 talking about people who have, you know, kind of been trapped by Satan, right? And that we, we talked about this, that as a good servant, we should be apt to teach, right? Delivering truth, right? And then God will work on them. Uh, if God peradventure will give them, repents to the acknowledging of the truth, and then they will recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, right? So that's how Paul ends chapter number two. And then Paul goes right into chapter number three. Be, you, you read it in verse one, it says, this know also. So hey, Timothy, 
There's going to be a time where people are not going to hold to the truth. There's going to be a time to where Christians, people in the church, right? That, that's what the end of chapter 2 is talking about. It's not talking about an unsaved person. It's talking about a saved person. That they're not going to know the truth enough and, or they're just going to be led away of their own lusts to where the Satan just has to kind of pull the, pull the trap because we're walking right into it. He starts off ver- chapter 3 saying, hey, this know also. Timothy, you know, as Paul Harvey used to say, there, this, the rest of the story. Right? Here, here's more to the story, Timothy. You thought it was bad at the end of chapter 2. Let's make it even worse. And, and so we're going to talk about perilous times, right? We, Paul reminds Timothy that in the last days, I, I mean, again, we don't have to convince you guys that we're in the last days, right? We're in the last days. And he says in verse 1, in the last days, perilous times shall come. I'm not going to convince you I will by looking at this, this bit of scripture, but we're in some perilous times. And we're... We're not in perilous times as some of us, you know, might think about them because Paul defines it a little bit differently. How does Paul define perilous times? He looks at the quality of man or Christian that's sitting in the pew. And you know what he says? He says, hey, the quality's not good. It's not. But as we're going to see and as we're going to talk about, that, doesn't, that shouldn't affect us as servants of the Lord, teaching and giving out the truth of God. So what does Paul say? How does Paul describe perilous times? Well, verse number 2 and on, he says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Again, we, we can look at this category and say, Yeah, the world's exactly like that. Absolutely, you're right. The world fits all of these categories. But you know, Paul's not talking about the world. He's talking about Christians. Unfortunately, right? I, I have it down here, you know, because this is the thing I think that surprised, w- would have surprised Timothy the most. You know, this surprised me the most as a young Christian, <laughs> right? That, wait, there are Christians that are lovers of their own selves? Wait, there's Christians that blaspheme, right? That, that, are, that are irreverent of the Lord? There's Christians that are unholy, that are disobedient to their Hey, kids, are you listening? No, right? It's a surprise. You know, you, you might have heard this, you know, when you ask somebody, hey, have you ever been to church? And, they, and, and the, the pad answer, you know, you might hear as you're, as you're going to these people and say, well, no, there's too many hypocrites in the church. Now, when, when I was a smart aleck back in the younger days, okay, I'm still a smart aleck, but I can control it more now than I can then. I used to, when they would say, well, hey, you know, there's just hypocrites in the church. You know, my response would be, well, hey, what's one more? Come join us. It's changed. My response to that has changed. When they say, hey, there's hypocrites in the church, I look at them and say, you are absolutely correct, and it shouldn't be that way. You know, Christians should not be hypocrites. You know, when a Christian says, yay, let your yay be yay and your nay be yay, hey, we should be people of our word. Paul is saying in perilous times, that's not the case. It gets to the point where he says in verse number two, they're disobedient to their parents. They're unthankful. You know, if you want to see a great illustration of, we're not going to look at it, of where unthankfulness leads us, read Romans chapter one. Again, a lot of times we think of that as an unsaved person, and sure, that's kind of true, but a saved person could fit in there just as well, right? Because if you look, it says they had the knowledge of God, but they got rid of it. So they had to have it first. So, so he's talking about perilous times, right? What we see, and we're going to talk about this, is really there's a, there's a lack of truth, right? Why, why would a Christian be unthankful? Well, because they don't know what they have to be thankful for, right? I mean, they just sing about it, right? God's great. Why? Because he died for our sins. Hey, if we don't have anything else to be thankful for, we can thank him for that from here to eternity, But what we see, other things, we see truce breakers. We see false accusers. We see liars. Right? That should never be. Right? We should speak edifying words to each other, it says in Ephesians 5. You know, he says traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of 
pleasures more than lovers of God. Again, it's about what we want. It's lust, right? It's our diverse lust. He even goes and he kind of breaks it up to verse number five. He, he kind of, he gives you all of this category, right? And, and you would agree with me, right, that, man, that's really bad, right? Yeah, Christians shouldn't do that. And, and I would agree. But then he hits us. Then, then Paul takes the baseball bat and just swings for the fences with verse number five. He says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You know a person who has a form of godliness would not do the things of verses 1 through 4? Right? Because they have a form of godliness. Outwardly, they're fine. But they're denying the power thereof. They're just all about the flesh. It's not about the spirit. Right? They're, they're cleaning up the flesh first with paying no mind to the Spirit. You know, Brother Freddie talked about it on Sunday night, about being balanced, right? That, but, but these people who have, you know, the form of godliness, their balance has tipped more towards the flesh. If you look at Jesus when he talked to the Pharisees, the Pharisees are a perfect illustration of those type of people, right? That they're whitewashed sepulchers. They look pretty on the outside, but on the inside they're full of dead men's bones, so occasionally what you will see is some things will come out and they'll be like, well, where'd that come from? What's on the inside? That's where that come from. But it doesn't stop there. This is why I said he took that baseball bat. Because these people that have the form of godliness are the same people in verse number six. Because it says, for this sort, the people that have the form of godliness but denying the power thereof, they're going into houses. And you know what they're doing? They're having Bible studies. And they're leading these people away. Why? Because they already have the lust in them. Here just comes somebody and says, you know what? Oh, man, you're struck. You were just born that way. It's okay. It's okay. Right? Here comes somebody that's, on, that's cleaned up on the outside, and you look and you say, man, that's a great person. And then they're coming in with some soft words. Hey, you know what? It's okay. Have, and it says, silly women, but, you know, men just just as much get caught up in this as well. Verse number seven, it says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I'm reading a book now, and it's about, actually, it's a lot about this. How people look great on the outside, but on the inside, they're not so great. And what they're doing is they're questioning the things of God, but all they're doing is just questioning they don't care about knowledge. They don't care about truth, right? They're just questioning and questioning and questioning. So then you're ever learning about these crazy things, but you're never coming to the knowledge of the truth. You're never getting anywhere. You know how, you know how interesting these people are? He, he, he compares them in verse number 8, where it says, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these. Right, again, comparing him back to the people in verse number 5. But you know who Janus and Jambres were? So Moses comes on the scene, stands in front of Pharaoh, and he throws his staff down. And what happens to his staff? Turns into a snake, and Moses does what each one of us, I will promise you, does. We run away. There's a snake. Ah, I'd run. But what do Janus and Jambres do? They throw their staffs down too. And they turn into you know what? These are people that can counterfeit spiritual things. They can counterfeit the quote-unquote power of God. Right? They look the part. That's one thing I never understood about that whole story with, the, with Janus and Jambres, right? Like, here comes the Egyptians, and nobody wants the plagues. So you know what Janus and Jambres do? Hey, we'll give you some more. Hey, look, Pharaoh, we can give you some more frogs. Look, we did it. So they're just increasing, right? But but the idea is that they're doing it. You know, th it's just interesting, right, that here Paul is telling this younger man, hey, Timothy, I warned you in chapter 2 what's going to happen. Now comes chapter 3. There's going to be people in your church, Timothy, and that you're going to lead, that you're going to try to work with. And it's going to be perilous. Because they're going to be lovers of their own self. They're going to be following after their own lust. They're not going to be what you expect them to be. 
In fact, in verse number 9, it says, they shall proceed no further. Right? That they can only go, they can only personally go so far. They can only take a group of people so far. Why? Because then their folly will find them out. Eventually, it will come to light what is happening. And unfortunately, and, th- and this is where the Seth, like this book I'm reading, I told Amy, I'm like, I'm just so mad. Because it's a pastor doing this. Right? But this, this guy can only take them so far. What happens is then a crash happens, and then all of the collateral damage, all of the people that have been hurt. And Paul is warning Timothy, Timothy, be aware. Oh, hey, Timothy, by the way, continue. You know, this is enough to just say, I quit. I'm done. You know, God, put somebody else in here. But again, we have to remember that Timothy was here for a reason. And so how is Paul telling Timothy to navigate these perilous times? I want to focus on three different things here. Despite the times, despite how perilous, how dark things look, Paul exhorts Timothy to continue with God. However, he says, hey, Timothy, there's a few things that you can still look to to strengthen your walk, to keep you going that other mile. Here's the first one. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, very familiar passage of Scripture, verse number 15. So I see three things that Paul kind of exhorts Timothy to keep his mind on, to keep looking forward, to move through these perilous times. Not only to move through himself, but to help others as well. Verse number 15, it says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The first thing Paul exhorts Timothy to keep his mind on is the truth. Hey, Timothy, I told you, right, that there's people who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. He says, and, and we'll look at it maybe, in, we'll look at it later, but in verse 13, right? Evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. He says, Timothy, in these times, there is a lot of deception. So you know how you fight deception? With truth. So you know, if, if Paul is telling Timothy, hey, you need to look to the truth to help you through perilous times, once you expect that God has given us the truth, Right? I mean, if you look, I mean, we're not going to go there, but it, the first thing that's attacked in the Bible is truth. Right? Because there's deception. You know, Satan works in deception. That, that's, his, that's how he kind of works in this world. And so we need a truth. I, I said this quote on Sunday morning. I love it. I, I just love it. Spurgeon said, when you come to a crooked stick, it's not our job to straighten the stick out. It's our job to lay a straight stick next to it to say, look, this one's straight, that one's crooked. Right? And, and Moody said this similar thing. Moody said when you come to a crooked stick, it's not our job to judge the stick. How dare you be crooked? What, what's wrong with you, stick? It's, hey, stick, here's a straight one. Here's the truth. This is what we should align to. Right? We should just teach. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, Timothy has been around the truth his whole life. He says, from a child, right? Timothy has been around truth his whole life. This is one thing I love about this church. When we first came here, we didn't really know anybody, but, you know, one of the things our kids wanted to do was go to class. We're like, sure, go to class. Plus, we were in the other building, so there wasn't enough space for our kids really to sit with us. So we're like, yeah, go to class. You know what kids get taught in this church? Truth. They get taught truth from the smallest days to, we're still kids in here, let's be honest, right? But they get taught the truth. However, the truth has to be transferred, right? It it has to eventually, right? We know that in Timothy's case, his mom and his grandmother taught him, but there had to be a time in Timothy's life where he understood it and it became personal to him. You know, there's going to become, you know, Lily you know, is growing up, there's going to come a time in Lily's life where it's not going to be okay to say, well, that's what mommy and daddy believe. This is what I believe. 
Why? And why? Well, because I've been, we'll see it, I've been assured of it. I've seen it live. I've seen it taught. I've seen it changed. You know, we have a friend back in Lafayette, and he said, he, he told me this about his kids. He says, I don't really tell them what to believe. I'm like, how does that work? And he's like, here's my prayer. I pray that they see the power of my God in me enough that they want to follow him. And I'm like, I'm out, see ya. <laughs> I, I cannot live up to that standard. No way. Timothy had that truth, right? Timothy, but, but Paul reminds Timothy, hey, you had it when you were a kid. You had it when you were growing up. You still need it now. You never outgrow truth. Deception is on the rise. You know, people are turning their ears away from truth. Why? Because sometimes truth hurts. You know, it does. How many people, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you guys have read your Bible and you've been struggling with something and that truth just cut? And you're thinking, Ugh. well, it did its job, right? And so we need to stick with truth. Let's go to Psalm 119. You know, Paul knew the importance of truth during perilous times when people seem to be falling away from truth, and when, when truth seems to be falling on this, in the streets. Right? We, we need truth. Psalm 119 is a great psalm, and it's all about the Word of God and our relationship to it, even when we struggle. You know, it, 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 it seems to me that sometimes when we go through our most trying times, we turn away from the only thing that can give us help. And that's for a variety of different reasons. I understand it. I've been there. But the truth gives us some things. Psalm 119, verse number 9. What does the truth do? The truth protects us. The truth warns us. Right? It, it's kind of the, the, the flashing yellow light when the bridge is out of where we're going. Psalm 119, verse number 9. It says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You know, the, the, the truth protects us, right? So, Timothy, you're going to be around a lot of people that are going to love themselves more than they love God, right? And, but it's going to look, you know, Spurgeon said discernment is not knowing right from wrong. That's not true discernment. True discernment is knowing right from almost right. That's true discernment. And you know how you get that discernment? This right here. This right here. If you remember the temptations of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ is being tempted by the devil. You know what the devil's using to tempt Jesus Christ? A badly interpreted word of God. You know how you tell that he had a badly interpreted word of God? Because we have the true word of God to compare it to. I mean, again, he's using the word. If Satan uses the word of God to try to tempt the word of God, what do you think he's going to use to tempt you? I mean, it, I mean, we're not Jesus Christ, let me tell you that. But you know how it protects us? Is again, if we put this in our heart, if we put this in us, when that... When that, that lie comes in, trust those bells that go off in your head, right? Trust it until you can study it out. Even from when I'm saying it. Now, I never say anything wrong. I mean, you can ask Brother Freddie. I never say anything <laughs> wrong. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You know what the Bereans did in the book of Acts? They did this to Paul. Paul, the greatest preacher in the New Testament, is giving them truth. And you know what the Bereans said? Time out, Paul. Let me just check what you're saying. Check it, right? And if, and if I fall in short, let me know. Because we want to be true to this word. The only thing that's inspired in here tonight is this word right here. That's it. So the word, the, the truth protects us. It warns us when we're going somewhere we shouldn't go. So verse number 28, it gives us strength. It gives us strength to stand up in these perilous times, to stand against the untruths that are out there. 
If you think it's easy to stand up against lie after lie after lie, whew, it's not. But you know what helps gives us strength? The Word of God, verse number 28. It says, My soul melteth for heaviness. But it says, Strengthen thou me according to thy word. Hey, you know, in perilous times, there are times when we feel like we're melting. Man, it's just, it's one thing after another, after another. Oh, and it just feels so heavy. Strengthen thou me according to thy word. Hey, Lord, I need your strength. Please give it to me. You know why that word can strengthen you? It's because it's never changing. It doesn't change. We can plant our feet on it, and it's not going to move. That's This is the foundation with which we have all of our doctrines and our beliefs right in that book. And it's not going to change. That gives us some strength during these perilous, perilous times. So how does truth keep us during perilous times? We said it gives us stability, right? Because the scriptures never change. Here's what it also does. Let's turn back to Timoth- uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. This is the stuff... This is the reason why we read the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. So the scriptures are given to us to strengthen us, right? We talked about that. I mean, in Psalm 12, I'm not going to talk through it again, but you see a generation of men that it says the godly have fallen away. But yet God still preserves his word through that generation. Hey, through these perilous times, God's word doesn't change. Man might, what man thinks about it might, but God's word doesn't change. Verse, chapter number 3, verse number 16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable. You know, it's profitable. It, it gives us some profit in a few areas. Number one, it gives us for doctrine. We'll talk about doctrine again, but that's just correct teaching, right? Correct beliefs. We'll talk about, like I said, we'll talk about doctrine in a minute. But it says for reproof. Hey, you know, the Bible's really good at telling us where we're wrong. I don't know if you know that. That's why I believe not a lot of people read their Bible. is because you just kind of get tired of being told, hey, you kind of fallen short in this area, and you kind of fallen short in this area. Hey, I, I, I get that. Hey, you know, Pastor Bishop, you could do a little bit better in this area. Yeah, I know God. But, you know, God doesn't just leave it there, right? God loves us enough to, he doesn't just say, hey, you're wrong. You know what he does? He says, for correction. Hey, you're wrong in this area. This is what I want. And this says, for instruction in righteousness. This is how you do it. That's great. Right? A lot of times we just focus on that reproof, but God isn't just a God of reproof. He's a God of restoration. How can he, we, we can't be restored if we don't know where we're wrong, but we can never be restored if we don't know how to get it right. And that's what the Word of God does. In these perilous times, when somebody comes to us and says something that isn't quite truth, and those bells go off, God not only says, hey, this thought is wrong. God says, this is the right thought, and this is how we make sure we keep it right. Now, it's just an interesting to note, just because I preached on it on Sunday morning, the Word of God thoroughly furnishes us unto all good works. If you remember that vessel we talked about, if we purge ourselves from different things, untruths, we are now prepared unto all good works. Right? So now, if we have the Word of God and we're standing on the Word of God, God can now use us to accomplish His will, which is a great, great thing. So that's the first thing is the truth. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 10. So how can we navigate these perilous times? Number one, the truth. That's really the big one. All of these others are built on that. Here's the next one. Verse number 10, it says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all, 
the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So, Paul says, Timothy, we're going through some perilous times. But you've got the truth. Here's the next thing you've got. You've got testimony of other people. You've got testimony of other people who have already been through perilous times. That's what Paul says. Paul says, hey, Timothy, you've been with me for ten years. Imagine being with somebody personally, walking the streets, ministering with them, just spending, eating all the meals with them. So, you know, if they chew with their mouth open, oh, you better be praying for patience. Just kidding. Right? But being with somebody for 10 years, imagine the knowledge you have gained about that person. You know what you cannot do if you are around somebody for 10 years? You cannot hide and be safe with that person. Because they will see it. Paul says here in verse number 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. Fully known, right? Paul, or Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, you know what I believe. Right? Not only do you know, you fully know. I mean, 10 years, that's a long time. You know, I've been with Pastor Knight for three years, almost three years in August, right? Three years, that's a long, that seems like a long time, but it's really not in light of 10, right? But he says, you've known my doctrine, Paul, or Timothy. Timothy, you know what I believe. And then we understand that really we can just skip over all this other stuff and go to, no. That's what we like to think, right? How many people have heard this? This is going to be my, see, it's not a rabbit trail because it's in my notes. How? Amen. Right? No. Right? But, but here, here's what happens sometimes, right? We, we hear a bunch of things about doctrine, right? You might hear doctrine divides, right? How many people have heard that before, doctrine divides? Well, how many people, and I do want you to raise your hand on this. How many pe people believe that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection? And you have to believe and trust on that. How many people believe that, right? Amen. Do you realize you have just now separated yourself from the majority of Christendom, quote-unquote? Now, how many people in here believe, and if you don't raise your hand, we have a great class called the Foundation Class that will teach you all of this stuff. How many people believe here that once you are saved, there's nothing that can separate you from that, no matter what you do. How many people believe that? Do you realize from that first group that you are now part of, you've separated yourself from 99% of that group? You know, that's what doctrine does. Doctrine naturally divides, right? Truth divides. That's what Jesus Christ says. He says, I've come to divide. And that's what he did. But here's where it kind of stops, though, is, is sometimes we get this idea, well, Doctrine's boring, though. I have books in there that are about this thick, and it's just about, you know, systematic theology. And if you've ever tried to read one of those books, read it before you need to go to bed. Because <laughs> it's boring. But, but you know, and, and you might have heard this. I've heard this before. Well, doctrine doesn't preach. Right. It does, though. It's just a little bit harder to sometimes. But here's what Paul teaches us in this section. And, and here's what I think. This is what I always take from this section of Scripture, is that Timothy would have known what Paul believed, right? You've known my doctrine. But Timothy also would have known how that doctrine affected his walk. He says, Timothy, you've known my doctrine, but you've also known my manner of life. You've known what I believe and how it affected my walk. Now, doctrine should affect our walk. What we believe about, you know, there's a lot of Christians who believe in eternal security. Right, that once you are saved, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. However, there's a lot of Christians who aren't walking that way. Right, that they're walking on eggshells around, oh, what am I going to do? Hey, right, we're, we're going to sin. Let me, let me just be upfront about that. That's why God put 1 John 1, 9 in there, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Right, that we're going to sin. Confess it and move on. Our doctrine, what we believe, should affect how we walk. Not only will it affect how we walk, he says, you've known my manner of life, but it gives us purpose. He says, Timothy, you know my purpose. And it all stems from doctrine, 
from the manner of life, how we're walking. Now we can work. Now we can do something. Then we get into the good stuff. Faith, long-suffering. You know how you tell somebody is long-suffering? Just spend 10 years with them. Or 15. Amen. Right? That's how you tell somebody's long-suffering. <laughs> right? Okay. We'll just let that breathe a little bit. and then, uh, Right? You, you know what faith and long-suffering are? Fruit of the Spirit. Right? We can, wait, let's quickly sing the song. Yep, that's right. Fruit of the Spirit. You know what charity and patience are not? They're not fruit of the Spirit, but you know what they are? They're outgrowths of that fruit. You know what an outgrowth of long-suffering is? Patience with other people. You know what the outgrowth of faith is, according to 2 Peter? And add to your faith virtue and to virtue, all those other ones, until you get to brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, what's, what's the word? Charity. You know what the outgrowth of faith is? Charity. When you're with somebody for 10 years, you learn that. You know where all that stems from? The truth and the doctrine that we believe. Paul says to Timothy, hey, we're going in through some perilous times. You got the truth, Timothy, but you also got my testimony. He brings up a few places where he says persecutions and afflictions. Persecutions and afflictions are usually those things brought on by other people. right? He, again, we're focusing on the people during this time period. They're persecuting and afflicting Tim, uh, Paul. Where? At Iconium and Antioch. If you look at I Antioch and Iconium in, in Acts, he had some issues with the Jews that rose up in those places. He had some disputes. They rioted. I mean, it was crazy. Not as crazy as the last person he says at Lystra. You remember what happened at Lystra with Paul in Acts chapter number 14. He got stoned. Man, those people, they would stone Paul in Lystra. Now, we talk about this, and, and, and I, I think Paul threw in Lystra for a purpose. I, I, I do. Timothy would have been told about Lystra by Paul. He wasn't there with him at that time. But Paul would have told Timothy about Lystra. But then Timothy, and, and again, it's not in here. This is why I'm stepping out. I, I can imagine this, that Timothy looked at Paul and said, Paul, didn't you go back to Lystra? Paul goes, yes, I did. Why? They stoned you. Why in the world would you go back? Because they needed the truth. Because I love them. Because I'm long-suffering and I'm patient with them. And hey, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Can you imagine being Timothy, following along with Paul, and then getting put in this position, and, and Paul writing a letter saying, hey, Timothy, remember what happened at Lystra? It might not be as severe for you now, but hey, keep going. These people need something. You know, when, in, when we are in perilous times, I, we've all experienced this. We've all experienced the, these perilous times that Paul talks about, you know, it's always great to look over to the person next to you and say, they're still standing. Amen. Hey, look, they're still pushing forward for Christ. Hey, if they're doing it, I can do it. You know, if they're doing it, I can do it. Paul is constantly using his testimony, using what he did to exhort people to go forward. Second Corinthians 1, we're not going to turn there, but 2 Corinthians chapter 1 is a great chapter on this. Again, it's that, hey, we know, how many people know our God is a God of comfort, right? We all know that until we experience it or see somebody else experience something, it stays up here a lot of times. It's got to move down here. And the way it does it, one way to do it is to read testimonies. You know, one of the greatest things to do as Christians is to read testimonies of missionaries in the past. We read missionary stories to our kids, right? Just to say, hey, look, these men went over just trusting in God, right? And they experienced some hardships, but they still trusted, right? It strengthens our faith. It keeps us going. So how do we navigate perilous times? We have the truth, right? And we have the truth. God has given us the truth. We can stand firm on 
We have the testimony of others. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. If you're there, great. Verse number 14. Here's what God does. Again, this is it's all based on the truth, but this is the way God is working it so that, hey, we can keep going. I brought this up before. You know, I wish we could always stay on the mountaintop, right? Because the mountaintop is great with you. But you know what you miss in the mountaintop? You miss roses. You miss lilies. And you miss the pretty flowers. Right? Because they don't grow up there. Right? They only grow in the valley. We just have to be looking for it. Because God puts it there. Second Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 14. It says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You know, we can navigate through perilous times by the truth of God. We can navigate through perilous times by the testimony of others. But we can also navigate through perilous times by teachers that we have in our life. And I'm not just talking about people who stand up from the pulpit or who teach a Sunday school class. Anybody, every one of us in here should be a teacher because we have the truth. And we need to impart that truth to others. That's what teaching is. You know, there were many people in Timothy's life that taught him the truth. We said it before, his grandmother, his mother, he had Paul. He had a variety of other different people that were in that, that he had interacted with. Paul was taught the truth. Paul tells him, though, here in verse number 14, and, and I have this circled in my Bible. Uh, it's not highlighted because then that would bleed through and I couldn't read the back page. But So it's circled. But it says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Right? So there's the teaching. Is the learning, right? It's it's that you've learned something. But he doesn't stop there. And this is where I think it's important. And it says, and has been assured of. It's more than just teaching. What do I mean by that? What does being assured of mean? Assured means made certain or confident, made secure or insured. What do I mean by that? You know, we, we can teach all we want. But if we don't live it, the people that we're teaching aren't going to be assured of that truth. We can teach it all we want, and that's the issue. I think that's a lot, you know, a lot of what Paul is saying in these perilous times. People are teaching a lot of different things. They're just not living it. And so Paul says, hey, remember, Timothy, you've had teachers in your life but they didn't just teach you. They assured you of it. You know, th this is more than just book learning. Right? This is more than just, hey, memorizing scriptures. It's actually living it out and watching people live it out. You know, I, I'm going to, they're not here. I wish they were. Well, Brother Gary's at the conference. But, you know, when, when Brother Gary and Miss Mina's grandson was murdered, Brother Gary taught on forgiveness. And you want to be assured of a truth? You watch people who have undergone a serious loss, a traumatic loss like that, and tell us that, hey, be forgiven them. Why? Because the Bible told us to. Man, you know, I learned a lesson that day. That, you know, some of the things I need to forgive for, and I'm still learning to forgive, aren't as serious as that. But I still need to do it. You know, this is what Paul is telling Timothy. Hey, we're in a perilous time. Remember the teacher. So I want to ask you guys a question. Is your life teaching those around you to be assured of the truth that we're espousing, that we're teaching? Is our life matching our word? This is the number one thing I have an issue with being a preacher. Let's be honest. Because if you've ever preached a sermon, if you've ever taught a Sunday school class, and you say something... It's always funny how that week, here comes a test. <laughs> Let's go, big boy. Do you believe what you preach? There was a time in my life as a younger preacher that all I would preach on was suffering. 
Yep. All right, let's go. Just pour it on. Now I, I'm preaching on happiness. Joyful. I'm hoping that none. Right? But once you know it, but once you know it, something's going to happen, right? Because you will be held accountable. This, you know, I, I, I know you guys think, and, and I love Pastor Knight, and I love the pastors here with Pastor Miller, but pastors are held to a double account because we teach other people. You know how, like, sobering that is? The, the most sobering thought ever was when I was sitting with Pastor Knight when we first got here, and he says, hey, I just wanted to let you know. People take notes. When you preach, they take they take those home, they talk about it as a family, and if there's something they need to change, they change it, they try to change it. And I looked at him, I said, wait, people actually listen to my sermon. And then I said, whoa, wait, they're actually changing the way they're living based on what the Word of God says because I've spoken it. Lord, help me. We're going to finish with this. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter number 6. I have this referenced out next to this section of Scripture where it says assured of. I go to Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Deuter- our kids have learned this section of Scripture. You know, it, it, again, we, we've used it here before. I say this, you can tell if a teacher believes what they teach. You can tell if a teacher is teaching something and they actually believe what they teach or they're excited about it. Because it's made a change in them. Because they're able to apply what they're teaching. You know, especially if you follow them for 10 years. And you see them every day of their life. And you just walk with them. You know, this is, this is true discipleship. Is life on life. Right? Th- this is true discipleship. Is doing life together. You know what the issue with that is, though? Is you have to open up your life to somebody else. And let me tell you, we're not perfect. And it's hard sometimes to say, hey, take a peek in and look at all of the things that we're still struggling with because everybody struggles with something. Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verse number 5, it says, uh, verse number 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, with all thy might, and thou shalt teach them. Whoops, verse number six. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. You know, we and it just goes on about constantly having the word of God. There's a lot of things that we try to teach that we don't have in our heart what it says here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them to thy children. You know, if we're teachers here, you know, the Bible says that God gave the church preachers and teachers for the perfecting of the saints or for the edifying of the, perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, right, for these things, to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, you know, it is very hard to teach something that you don't know yourself. And God, I'll, I'll say this, God is a God of experiment, uh, experiential learning. What do I mean by that? He puts you through trials. Yay! Who wants a trial? And, you know, you get a trial. No, I'm just kidding. Right? But that's how we learn. That's how this becomes real. And when this becomes real, guess what? We can now teach it. Paul says, hey, Timothy, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Look at, look at this. Look, there's deception. There's lust. There's people who are pretending to be something that they're not, right? Look at all of these things that are happening. But, Timothy, you need to keep going. How are you going to keep going? Well, you've been given the truth. You have the Word of God to stand firm on. Timothy, how are you going to keep going? Well, Timothy, look at what I've taught you. Look at what I've lived through. Look at me. He's not saying it as a prideful way. He's just saying, hey, 
Look at all the persecutions and afflictions that I've been through, Timothy. And again, he's not saying, Timothy, compare them to me, right? He's not saying, oh, Timothy, you don't have it as bad as I did. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, hey, Timothy, look, it's common. Yea, all that live godly shall suffer persecution. Look to the testimony of others. And then finally, hey, Timothy, there have been people in your lives that have taught you. But not only taught you them, but assured you of them. Do it for them. Keep going for them. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. You know, you don't have to look around. And like I said at the beginning, you don't have to look around the world. You don't have to look around the church very long to notice that we're in some perilous times. We are. Times are tough. You know, my prayer uh, has always been... And it was a little selfish at the beginning. Hey, Lord, you can just come back tonight. I don't want to go to work tonight. Please come back tonight. But that's really my prayer, right? Like, Lord, just please come back, right? Get us out of here. Because it's going to get harder. Please come get us. But, But while we're here, we need to be working. We need to be pushing through. We need to be prepared into all good work. We're in some perilous times, but like Paul does with Timothy, I'm just exhorting you. Let's go and pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for all you've given to us. Lord, we understand that we're in some perilous times. But Lord, I thank you that you've given us things to help us navigate those times. Lord, I'm thankful that we have a truth that we can stand firm on. Lord, that we have others in our lives that have gone through some things that we can look to and get some strength from. And And Lord, I am just thankful that we have some teachers, and you've put teachers in my life and in all the people out there's lives, Lord, to give them the truth. Lord, we thank you for all you've given to us. Lord, we again pray that your Holy Spirit and and the Word of God just have free course and service tonight. Lord, we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. As the piano plays, the altar is open if you need it.